Glad to have you with us. Now, government says it is shocked at the inconsistent position of the Ghana Medical Association towards the implementation of the drone delivery health system after their association's general secretary, Dr. Justice Yangson, supported its implementation at the initial stages. Now, the Ghana Medical Association, GMA, on Tuesday demanded the immediate suspension of the medical drones contract, accusing government of failing to consult it. Uh, but speaking to journalists Wednesday morning, Deputy Information Minister Pius Hajide uh, revealed the General Secretary of the Ghana Medical Association, Justice Yangson, pledged the association's full support for the rollout of the drone system when he met the Vice President earlier this year. The Vice President, al Haji Dr. Mahmoudou Baumia, announced to the Ghana Medical Association government's intention to roll out the project as part of efforts to ensure effective healthcare delivery. The Ghana Medical Association welcomed the decision by government and to quote the General Secretary of the GMA, Dr. Justice Yangson's reaction to the announcement, and I quote, well, as for us as an association, on countless occasions, we have bemoaned the state of emergency medical service in the country. So, if efforts are being made by the government to ensure that we strengthen that sector, we strengthen that aspect of our healthcare delivery, then we say kudos. Government is therefore taken aback at the current position of the GMA when it says, and I quote, the proposed services to be provided by the drones do not conform to the primary health care policy in Ghana. Now, just by way of information, here's Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Baumia speaking at the 2018 Annual Health Summit in April this year on the drone service. The government is also trying to resuscitate the National Ambulance Service. As you all know, uh, the, our National Ambulance Service is basically comatose. Uh, there's an ambulance service without ambulances. So it, it's a bit difficult to operate. And thanks to the leadership of the president, Nana Adudankwa Akufuado, he said, this doesn't make sense. Every constituency in this country should have an ambulance as part of a fleet of the National Ambulance Service. So the procurement has begun, and definitely in 2019, we will have every constituency, at least 275 ambulances, they are coming. Uh, and I think it will be very, very, very helpful for, for us. In addition to the ambulances, that, that will be coming in 2019. We are also um, looking at how to get very critical blood deliveries and critical medicines delivered at very remote hospitals, for example, in clinics. We are in a situation where a lot of mothers are dying in, at childbirth because critical blood supplies are not available. Sometimes, you know, it gets more difficult. You may have, uh, even if you had an ambulance, just the distance to travel to those places may be very difficult. And this is why we are taking a leaf from the experience of Rwanda on this issue. And we have persuaded the private sector to fund a drone delivery service for blood and critical medicines like snake serum and so on that doctors will need. They will set up in about four areas in Ghana and be able to reach any clinic within a maximum of about 20 minutes to drop the blood or the medicines for doctors. We've gone to Rwanda, we've seen how it is operated. We have talked, taken our civil aviation there and by the grace of God, we will see this operating in the first quarter of 2019, all over Ghana. And we, we are asking for your support. 
thankfully it is not being paid by government. So we are just that was back in April, Dr. Baumia speaking then. Our Deputy Information Minister, Pius Hajide, meanwhile says, governments can only give clarity to various stakeholders who do not understand the concept as the drone service will not be scrapped. Once the Parliament of Ghana has passed uh, the deal, it, has now, it is now binding. We are grateful to Parliament for that. It is now binding. And uh, we expect that in the shortest possible time, uh, implementation will commence. Government is, however, willing and ready to engage with any stakeholder who seeks to engage with a view to giving uh, clarity on the matters on which they may lack understanding and clarity. We think that the GMA may only require uh, a further explanation on the matter. Now, away from that, the Ghanaian medical doctor who helped save the life of a passenger on a KLM flight has been sharing the full story on the Super Morning Show Enjoy 99.7 FM. Uh, the female passenger on the flight from Amsterdam to Accra uh, collapsed after suffering several uh, severe abdominal pains from an allergic reaction. The Ghanaian doctor, Chief Superintendent Dr. Samuel Othori, along with a German doctor, Professor um, Manfred Spisnas, worked together on board the flight to save the life of the passenger. Dr. Fori admonishes the public to be aware of the food they are allergic to in order to keep themselves safe. But first, here's the patient, Catherine. I couldn't move. So I was just showing um, signs to the next um, passenger sitting next to me. So I just asked her to call the, the crew member that I'm not feeling well. I started sweating, feeling so uneasy. And suddenly I pass out. What I realized is that I was throwing up a lot. And then when it happened to me, the, 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 the deadly, deadly, um, how do I call it, reaction is instant diarrhea. Instant diarrhea. I would just, it just come from me like a water running through my anus. So I started throwing out. And then after throwing out, I seized breath. I get a tight chest, I can't breathe, I can't do anything, and I have so much height from my skin. My skin was burning like fire has poured on my skin. It, it was terrible. I can't describe the feeling I had on the plane. But it, it, it's okay, I had it before. And, but this one, my only concern is how I got so naked on, in, in the presence of the, a lot of people. That is what my concern is. Mm. It was so embarrassing, very, very embarrassing. So that's how bad the burning was. You had to take yes, off your clothes. Yes, the burning was like I, I couldn't contain my clothes. I have to take everything out. And I was screaming for them to help me to take the clothes off because the crew no, my members don't know what was happening to me and they don't know the reaction to the, the allergies that I have. They, they was a bit hesitant to help me remove the clothes. But I, 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 I had a shoe on, riding shoe, with my leggings and my dress on top. I have to force the lady to pull my, my running shoe, pull my um, everything except my underwear. It, 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 it was terrible, Daddy. It was terrible. I couldn't contain the burning sensation that I was having on my skin. It's like a fire has poured on me. Wow. It, 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 and, and I have, when, when I became conscious, I realized that um, I have skin, uh, highs on my skin, bumps. Dr. Fori has also been speaking to Joy News. Anything that you are allergic to, just put it down, document it, and make an emphasis to your, to your health personnel and let them know this, this are the situation. Yes, sometimes, uh, you know, because of situations that happen around, um, you say your medical personnel will reject mm. what, 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 what you are saying. But um, still insist that and and get that information across. I think it will be on a on a on a on a less per, uh, a lower percentage of mm. group of health workers that will ignore. We'll ignore if you yes. say okay. Yes. I mean, what the teaching is that you have to take the medical history of the of the individual, mm -hmm. and the history and the information that the patient is giving you, is is the ultimate uh, uh, what call it your weapon or. 
that is your, 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 your substructure that you are using, you're going to use to make your diagnosis okay. and management. So uh, you don't denounce any, any information that, that any, any patient gives to you. Mm. Now, the Ghana Anti-Corruption Coalition, GACC, is championing a nationwide round of activities to compel governments to give the necessary attention to the passage of the anti-corruption bills into laws. As part of efforts engaged in, uh, they engaged in a float in Kumase to commemorate the 2018 International Anti-Corruption Day in Ghana. Communication Assistance Officer for the Coalition, Faustina Jabati, says um, government's posture to the anti-corruption bills is not encouraging. Prince Apia joined the coalition and reports. The International Anti-Corruption Day presented opportunity for Ghanaians to deeply reflect on the negative effects of corruption on Ghana's development and future. Participants at the Kumasi Walk from the Jubilee Park to the Kumasi Metropolitan Assembly carried placards with anti-corruption messages. This year's theme challenges Ghanaians to reflect, rethink and pledge to say no to corruption. Ghana Anti-Corruption Coalition Assistant communication officer Faustina Jabati says it is incumbent on all citizens to galvanize collective action to eradicate corruption in Ghana. We are calling on government to ensure the following. The passage of the credible and robust right to information law to ensure that citizens can easily access public information, particularly information on budgets, contracts, foreign agreements or treaties, as well as procurement to the transparency and accountability. Timely passage of key anti-corruption bills, particularly conduct of public office bill, whistleblowers amendment bill, companies amendment act, and urgent presentation presidential assent to the witness protection bill. Effective implementation of the National Anti-Corruption Action Plan, NACAP, as well as other key anti-corruption conventions such as African Union Convention Against Corruption and the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. Member of the coalition and executive director of ABAC Foundation, Philip Dia, says government must be transparent in its fight against corruption to allow for public monitoring. As citizens, we want to hear, we want to know how much of our budget was used on projects, how much are our project costing up, who has been given the contract, and then when is the person supposed to finish that contract? We want to get involved as citizens. We want them to be responsible. We want the citizen, we want our citizens to we want them to be accounting to us so that we can also know what is happening. Once we know what is happening, then we can monitor. We want the government to pass the right information bill. You go to you, you, you go for information and then they will tell you that pass here, do this, do that. They will find so many ways to deny you of the information and because of that you cannot even ask even for your right. The 9th of December every year is observed as International Anti-Corruption Day to increase national awareness and sensitize public on the cost of corruption. Prince Apia reporting. So what you enjoy news today. Now we stay with the issue of corruption and the rights information bill because uh, Parliament has this morning resumed consideration of the various amendments of uh, that particular legislation. Uh, normally um, these amendments to the RTI are done later in the day but um, in a surprise move it's being done in the early hours of the day. Joseph Opoku Gakpo has joined us on the line to tell us um, the exact implications of what is going on in the first place. Um, uh, Joseph, what, how far has the House gone with the consideration of the RTI bill. Uh, and so you would know that there are more than um, 91 clauses as far as the bill itself is concerned. And uh, from what is happening on the floor, there are something in the region of um, clause 30, which means they still have quite a long way to go with the bill of consideration. But the interesting bit is this, that on a normal basis, the House will usually consider bills and make amendments a little later in the day when they're done with all your items like questions for uh, ministers, like um, statements by MP, like considering of various loan agreements and all. But today, sometime around 11:15, uh, uh, the House moved on to have a conversation around the right information bill itself and began uh, considering the various amendments. And uh, then there were quite a number of MPs on the floor, but even as the consideration continued, right now there are just about 30 of them 
on the floor going ahead with the various amendments. The chairman of the Constitutional Legal Affairs Committee has been leading that, and they're hoping to make as much progress on that before they would return to considering the budgetary estimates of the various ministries, departments, and agencies a little later in the day. Now, Joseph, this is an interesting conversation because uh, you were telling me once on the Super Morning Show on Joy FM, this bill cannot be passed before the year ends. And that has been confirmed by the Vice President. And an example was given about how Parliament um, adjourned sitting somewhere around 1 p.m. one day when the RTI was still there to be considered and then later asked for an extra day to sit on a Saturday uh, mm. to consider appropriations. Uh, how would you call this posture now? I mean, from where you stand in Parliament, what's the new posturing of the House towards the RTI bill? Now it's looking like uh, the commitment to get the processes going uh, are, are, are happening uh, because ordinarily even when it, I, I, it comes to around this time when they are looking at budgetary estimates for various ministries, departments and agencies and mind you the house has less than uh, 10 days to sit before the ground break eventually next week Friday and so around this time there would be the dedication of a lot of the time considering the budgetary estimates of the various ministries, departments and agencies. But it looks like with all the pressure that are building up, the concerns that are coming up from various civil society groups, um, the, the parliamentarians would want to show that there is a certain commitment to getting the RT, uh, you know, the RTI bill out um, in, in the midst of all the concerns. Although it's now evidently clear that they would not be able to get this bill passed and approved before the House goes on break on the next week Friday. But clearly, they would want to put out the indication that they are committed to working on the bill. The decision to, for example, consider it in the morning is an indication of that. And although a lot of the MPs are out, uh, sometime last week, uh, an issue came up about quorum and the number of MPs who were in the House even who were looking at the RCI bill to the extent that the first deputy speaker ordered a suspension of the standing orders in order to allow to consider the bill. So, uh, yes. Right. Right, Joseph. Unfortunately, we lost Joseph there, but uh, the import of what he was saying really is that Parliament seems to be showing a greater commitment to the passage of the RTI bill. I would have been curious to find out, of course, um, if there's any indication that this new time for considering the amendments uh, would continue, uh, but we will be finding out that uh, later on in the day. Uh, for now, we'll take a few important messages, but when we come back, stakeholders in performance of funerals of two late kings of Dagbon pledge support ahead of rights and also to ensure their supporters comport themselves. We'll hear from them. The very concluding expressions or words expressed by all of them is that they all want the bong to have peace. Thanks for staying with us. Now, security expert at the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping and Training Center, Dr. Christianin, says that the public should tread cautiously in assuming that the roadmap signed by the interested parties in the Dagbon dispute brings closure to the problem. He says the agreement signed should only be seen as a framework for the peace process, urging governments to channel more resources towards addressing the emotional interests involved. That the actual signing of a peace agreement is the beginning of a process that seeks to build trust and to arrive at a point where the contending parties can say we are satisfied with what we have got out of the mediation process. I think it's dangerous and wrong for the generality of the public to misconstrue the agreement that was presented as a necessarily final document okay. in which every single one agrees. No. This is where we've agreed based on what we know because one of the most contentious issues about the whole process was who gets into the Brewer Palace to perform the funeral rites first. 
leaves it and allows somebody else to go in. Now, the December 13 crucial event is the first of a peace roadmap reached between the two feuding chieftaincy factions and the Otunfo Osetu to the second led mediation committee. Friday's ceremony is to enable the Abudu royal family to perform the final funeral rites of Yana Mahamdu uh, Amdulai. After that ceremony, there will be a one week break, after which the final funeral rites for Yana Yakubu and Dani the second will also be uh, performed from January 4 to 19, 2019. The Asante has meanwhile issued a statement warning no faction or gate should enskin any chief within this period. And the stakeholders in the performance of uh, the two funerals, or the funerals of the two late kings of Dagmo, have pledged their support ahead of the funerals and also to ensure their supporters comport themselves. Briefing the media after a visit to the various palaces and inspection ahead of the funerals, Northern Regional Minister Salifu Said said stakeholders have agreed to ensure the funerals are performed in a peaceful environment. I want on behalf of the Municipal Security Committee of Yendi Municipal Assembly as well as the Northern Regional Security Council RESEC to welcome you to the Old Bewa Palace in Yendi. Uh, we have come to assess the extent of work with regards to the construction of a temporary palace at the Bewa Palace to facilitate the implementation of the roadmap that was rolled out by the committee of eminent chiefs to see to it that come 14th of this month, that is the funeral of the date Yana Mahamadu the fourth will kick start. That is 28th of December 2018, after which January 4th to 18th of the same month, January 2019, they would have kickstart the funeral of the late Yana Yakubo and Dani II. Now, co-founder of the West African Network for Peace Building, WANEP, Imano Bombande, says the level of progress made in resolving the Dagmo Chitensi conflict must be appreciated. Yeah, however, he wants those leading the enforcement of the roadmap to peace in the area uh, to desist from sounding instructive and be more persuasive, especially as the funeral rites of one of the two late overlords begins on Thursday. He spoke on PM Express with Evans Mentor Tuesday night. Confidence building also comes with the assurances mm -hmm. and reassurances of key leaders and stakeholders in the mediation process. Okay. Because there were questions about nobody has come to talk with me about my father's funeral. Yeah. So he too is in a situation in which, whether you like it or not, he's regent, he's the overall of Dagon, but he also has concerns about, so what is going to happen? Yeah. And let's not run away from the narrative. Mm. Though we are, tonight we don't want to talk yeah. about the past. Yeah. But we have come from a very difficult and complex past. Mm. So now if we can use the remaining hours for those reassurances, those guarantees that the process is inclusive, mm -hmm. and I want to emphasize mm -hmm. that word that uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Enning used, it's very inclusive. And in the mediation process, don't worry, even if you mm -hmm. feel that you did everything that was right. But one of the parties says, I feel excluded, mm -hmm. or people are not coming to me and talking about my father's funeral. There is a voice that says, I'm in need of something. Mm -hmm. Okay. You need to respond Approach to it. Yeah. Approach me. Approach yeah. me. Talk to me. Yes. Talk to me. Okay. So that's why mediation now will refrain from the attitude of directives okay. and instructions. Yeah. But when you are a state and you don't have your own capacity yeah. to resolve your own problems yeah. peacefully, yeah. you are in real trouble. Yeah. So I'm gratified that it doesn't matter how the headers have been and how difficult it has been. Ghana, from uh, the tragedy of 2002 on Dagon has consistently tried to make sure that we are responding and we are dealing with this. Now, away from that story, three inmates have been discharged, whilst 21 have been granted bail after the Justice for All program moved to the Tamale Central Prison. Seven applications for bail were refused, whilst one was stroked out because the inmate had been discharged by a trial court. The sitting was held at the forecourt of the prison. Correspondent Martina Bugri reports. 
the Justice for All program is in the northern region for two days. At today's sitting, 32 applications were dealt with. Speaking to the media after the sitting, presiding judge, Justice C.J. Honyanuga, expressed worry about the increased cases of murder. He said it was a worrying situation for the country. My observation, another observation is that we, we had a lot of murder cases. And like we had in the world the other time. Uh, I, mean, I think something ought to be done about this. Murder is becoming too much in this country. Almost everywhere we go, murder tries to, or it's, 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 it tries to form a greater part of the cases that we do. And uh, I think the authorities uh, involved should uh, sit up better than they are doing now. I think everybody has to be vigilant and uh, to, 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 to put in preventive measures, you know. Some people just shooting people just at random using color accent. For example, one of the cases that I had, the person just choose an accent, finish off his, his fellow human being. That's, that's just too, too, too bad. It's too bad. And it, it's becoming rampant throughout the country. It's every prison that we have, uh, we to, the murder cases form the majority, which is, which is not too good for all of us in Ghana. He said congestion rates in prisons have decreased from 32% in 2007 to 12%. Justice Honyanuga said this is the first time the program would be held in district prisons. Yes, and the congestion rate has come down to 33%. It was from 33% in 2007. Yes, now it's about 12%. Yes. It's about 12 percent. And uh, uh, yes, tomorrow we are continuing to the local prison in Salada. Uh, and then from there, we'll continue to Nabrungo prison. And then uh, I must also add that uh, uh, going to Salada will be the first time that the program, the Justice for program, will be held there. And also in uh, Nabrungo, we have never held the program over there. So that will be our first time. The, the exercise is to decongest the prisons. Uh, those uh, who have been on remand for so long uh, and who should not have been, yes, we consider them and consider granting bail to them or discharge them. Uh, that is the Northern Regional Public Relations Officer of the Prison Service, David Afacho, said the Tamale Central Prison was built to contain 78 inmates, but currently it houses about 234. He appealed for support for the construction of more housing in the prison. This prison was built to take the capacity of 78 inmates. But as of this morning, our lockup was at 234. So exercise like this comes to relieve us this pressure. The remand prison is supposed to house 16 prisoners, but today we are having about 104 prisoners in custody. So with this number, this 32, even it is not all who have been admitted today, taking the seven out, you agree with me that there is still pressure on the facility. So we are pleading to NGOs if they can support putting up a single story or add additional burden since others have cases that cannot be admitted today so that we will be able to house them in those facilities. Still haven't joined you today with me, Daniel Dazi. Coming up in business, IMF Managing Director Christine Lagarde is set to visit Ghana from the 16th to the 18th of December 2018. Sandra Esenamapenu brings you more after this.